The scriptures teach that those who have called on the name of Jesus are no longer under the law, but under grace. The title of my message today is, When Grace Fills Your Heart. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace, for your unmerited favor, for your abundant love wherewith you have loved us. And I pray that we will walk in that grace, that we will dwell in that grace, that we will live in your grace, and that your favor will carry us, seal us, that your grace will be sufficient for us all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus makes it very clear that he has not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but rather to fulfill them. Jesus said that except our righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 5 20, we will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The righteousness that the Pharisees and scribes sought to attain was a righteousness through works. They took the laws of God and translated the laws of God into rules and regulations. And then they impose those rules and regulations upon others, even though they themselves struggled as sinful human beings to maintain those rules and regulations. And so Jesus came to establish a righteousness that is offered as a gift. Jesus was made sin for us. He who was sinless was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Righteousness, right standing with God, is a gift that is offered through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, what does it mean? What did Jesus mean when he said he has not come to abolish the law, to destroy the law, but to fulfill it? What Jesus meant was, one, that he himself, would satisfy all of the righteous requirements of the law. Jesus was sinless. He, he kept the law perfectly. Also in the law, there were a multitude of animal sacrifices that were made to cover the sins of mankind. Uh, Jesus, and, and there's a, a, a biblical law, a spiritual law that says this, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Well, Jesus uh, fulfilled the sacrificial requirements of the law by offering his blood, his perfect blood, as a sacrifice for all of mankind's sins. Unlike animal sacrifices, which had to be made over and over again, the priest would make a sacrifice for the sins of the people and for his own sins. The high priest once a year would lay hands on a goat that would be called the scapegoat to transfer the sins of the people onto that goat and that goat would go wandering in the wilderness and then would take another animal and slay that animal and go to the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. Well, Jesus Christ did not need to offer up a sin sacrifice for his own sins because he had no sin. He offered up himself once and for all, for the sins of all mankind. And the, we, the way we know that his sacrifice was accepted is that God 
raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And so Jesus establishes the righteousness of God by living right and offering up a perfect sacrifice. Now we, through faith in him, receive that righteousness as a gift. The Bible says in Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. And so, and we're going to go to Romans chapter 6. The scripture informs us that we are not under the law, but we are under grace. Jesus fulfilled the law and we are no longer under the law. We're going to look at Romans chapter 6 beginning in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Don't let your body dictate to your spirit what you're going to do. Your body might want to lust after a man or lust after a woman. Bring it under subjection to the Holy Spirit. Don't objectify people and, and lust after them, but rather love them and see them through God's eyes. Your flesh may tell you, if you're gonna get out of this situation, you're gonna have to lie. You, you're gonna have to kind of twist the truth because there's no easy way out. But don't succumb to that temptation to lie. Instead, be a truth teller. Be a, a person who, who speaks uncompromised truth and let God fight your battles. When you speak truth and stand on uh, the strength of God's word, then God will stand on your side. So the Bible says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body. You know, if you give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. You might say to yourself, oh, just this once. I'm just going to dibble and dabble just this once. You give the devil an inch, he'll take a mile. You crack the door for the devil and let him get his foot in, he's going to try to bust open that door and take over your house, take over your home, take over your mind, take over your body. We got to get violent with the devil sometimes. And when I talk about violent, I'm not talking about physical violence. I'm talking about spiritual. We've got to take up the weapons of our warfare and defeat the devil by the word of our testimony and the blood of the lamb. The devil is an accuser of the brethren. He accuses believers before God. Occasionally, and we read about this in the book of Job and also in the book of Revelation chapter 12. There are occasions where God allows Satan to come before him. And when Satan comes before God, he accuses the brethren. But the Bible says in Revelation chapter 12 that we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony, loving not our lives unto the death. Satan would love nothing more than for sin to devour you, for sinful thoughts, sinful motives, sinful deeds, sin consciousness. He would love nothing more than for those things to overwhelm you. So you have to be uh, forthright. You have to be uh, aggressive in dealing with temptation. You have to be aggressive in dealing with demonic forces. Remind yourself that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. When the devil comes to you with temptation, speak the word of God. Remind the devil of the testimony that you have, that you are not who you used to be, but that you are blood washed and born again, sanctified and set apart by the Holy Ghost. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those who are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Think about a flute, you know. The musician plays the flute. The, the flute is a receptacle for, for the air and the finger motions of the musician. Allow God to breathe life into you by spending time in his presence, by worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And let him dictate the melodies and harmonies of your life. Let the Holy Spirit 
lead you in what you say and what you don't say. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in how you dress. Let the Holy Spirit uh, lead you on your job and dealing with the various situations that rise up on your job. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in how you raise your children. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in how you deal with your enemies. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in everything that you do. Yield yourself unto God, not unto sin. Don't let the devil play you. Don't let your emotions play you. Because if you let your emotions play you, people will play you. People like to play people whose emotions are not governed by their spirit. Bring your spirit, bring your emotions into the armor. Don't let your emotions rule and dictate your behavior. Let's say, for instance, just you're just kind of feeling down. Sometimes we just feel down. You know, we just go through a day. It could be that it's been a long time since the sun has come out. It just could be just a physical time of the month. Something's happening. Our bodies, we might just feel down in our bodies. But don't let that down feeling dictate how you conduct yourself during the day. Splash some water on your face. Shake yourself. Lift up your hands and glorify God and declare, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm not going to let a down feeling dictate my day because God is the one who governs my day. God is the one who leads my day. For the scripture says in verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but grace. You are not under the law, but you are under grace. All right, let's see if we can understand this. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 that he did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. He did not come to abolish it, but to fulfill it. Then the scripture says in Romans 6 14, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So does that mean that the law has nothing to do with the believer's life? Christ has fulfilled it. I'm not under it. It no longer exists. Is that what this scripture means? No, it doesn't. You see, under is a preposition. And we are truly no longer under the law. Under is a preposition. You might say the preposition is anything you can do to a cloud. You can go over a cloud, under a cloud. You can be in a cloud. You can go through a cloud. You can travel around a cloud. Anything you can do to a cloud is a preposition. And so let's say that this sheet of paper here represents the law, the ceremonial law, the civil law, the moral law. Okay. There was a period of time in the Old Testament that people were under the law. Right now, I am under this sheet of paper. This sheet of paper is above me. I am under it. Let's say that this represented the law in the Old Testament. People were under the law. All right. Now, I'm going to take this envelope. I'm going to fold this sheet of paper. And now, notice what happens. All right. Did the sheet of paper cease to exist? Did it cease to exist? No. It didn't cease to exist. What happened is I took it and I put it in the envelope. I am no longer under it. But just because I am no longer under it does not mean that it ceases to exist. Now it is in, the, the sheet of paper is in the envelope. Well, the scripture says that we are no longer under the law. But just because we are no longer under the law does not mean 
that the law ceases to exist. It's just our relationship to the law has changed. You see, once you get born again, no longer are you under the law. You know, where the, the law acts like a schoolmaster, you know, popping you every time you get out, out of line and, and letting you know the severe consequences of specific sins. We are no longer under the law, but that doesn't mean that the law no longer exists. According to the book of Hebrews, now the law is written into the tables of our heart. God has carved the law into our hearts. Let's look at this in Romans, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. We are no longer under the law, but rather we are under grace. The Bible says in Romans, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 15, whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sin and iniquities will I remember no more. Do you see that in verse 16? This is part of the new covenant. That God will put his laws into our hearts. So now we are no longer under the law. But that doesn't mean that the law ceases to exist. God has put the law into our hearts. He has etched them into the fleshly tables of our hearts. And that's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing because we're not just looking for something external to govern our right living. God has put the law in us and he, and he has deposited the Holy Spirit in us and through a relationship with him, rather than just merely trying to follow rules and regulations to obey God, out of the abundance of a love relationship with God, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we're able to live out the law that he has etched in our hearts. And so we are no longer under the law, but now we are under grace. What is grace? Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. G, God's, R, riches, A, at, C, Christ, E, expense. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace is God's unmerited favor. God's undeserved favor. When Christ fulfilled the law, he ushered us in to the dispensation of grace. A dispensation is just a fancy way of saying a way in which God is dealing with people. God is dealing with us now, not according to our sinfulness, but according to Christ's righteousness when we believe in him. God loves us. And through the power of his Holy Spirit enters into a love relationship with us where he showers us with grace upon grace upon grace. So Jesus lets us know that he's come to fulfill the law. And in fulfilling the law, he has changed our position relative to the law. We're no longer under the law, but the law is in us. Now we are under grace. And I don't know about you, but I love being under grace. You know, when you're under grace, what you what you got to do is just surrender and say, God, you say that I'm special. So I'm special. God, you say that I'm loved. So I am loved. God, you say that I'm forgiven. I receive your forgiveness and I thank you for it. God, you say that I am the head and not the tail. And so I thank you that you cause everything I put my hand to to prosper. We have to live under grace. Now, let's ask this question. What difference does grace make? After Jesus lets us know in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20, that he's come to fulfill the law, that we have to have a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the, the Pharisees and of the scribes, he paints a picture of what it looks like to live under grace. What difference does grace make? Number one, when grace fills your heart, you won't harbor anger towards others. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 through 26. 
I don't know about you, but life is just too short to spend my day angry at other people. Why? I mean, there, there are so many things to be happy about. There are so many things to be joyful about. There are so many things to rejoice in. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If I were to die today, I would go to heaven. God loves me with an unconditional love. God has put potential and power in me for me to live out his purpose on this earth. No matter what people say or do to me, God loves me. I, I can actually rejoice when people treat me evil because they treated Jesus evil. And so if I'm treated evil for the cause of God's sake, then that shows that, that God considers me worthy to suffer shame for the cause of Jesus Christ. Why should we spend our time angry with others? But, but Jesus makes it very clear that, you know, that we, we got to have a heart that's filled with love. That we shouldn't uh, be speaking down at people, but understanding that even evil people are loved by God. And rather than hating our enemies, we should love our enemies. Husbands and wives, don't go to bed angry with each other. Get it right before the sun sets. Brothers and brothers, brothers and sisters, sisters and sisters, friends, don't go to bed angry. Do your best to reconcile. Do everything that's within your power to reconcile because you are operating in grace. And so if somebody does you wrong, extend grace to them. And if you do somebody else wrong, receive God's grace and ask the person's forgiveness and then receive the grace of God. But don't walk around angry. Number two, when grace fills your heart, you will look at people as creations of God rather than as objects. You know, Jesus talks about how if, if a man lusts after a woman, and I'm sure the same would be the, the case, a woman lusting after a man, that they've committed adultery already in their hearts. I think sometimes men and women, we, we, we got to examine ourselves. You know, men are, are 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 you looking at women from God's eyes, or do you see women as objects, as curves, as 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 objects to be undressed with your eyes? No, no. God has not called a Christian man or Christian woman to be a predator. To, 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 to lust uh, after something that God says is not yours. And so we can't look at people as objects there to gratify our own physical, lustful desires. But people are created in the image of God. They're people that Jesus died for. And when you let that seep down in your heart and allow God to become involved, and when, when, you, when you receive the grace of God and walk under that grace, God will enable you by his grace to love people rather than to lust after them, to see them as valuable rather than seeing them as objects. That's what the grace of God will do in your life. And so it's so important for us to spend time meditating on God's word, thinking about the goodness of God. If you just go around saying, I won't lust, I won't lust, I won't lust, that's not going to cut it. But if you get to know God better day by day, day by day, all those lustful thoughts that try to harbor themselves in your mind and, you know, those eyes that want to wander will be so controlled by the Holy Spirit, that rather than lusting, you will love. Rather men than seeing women as objects, you'll see them as daughters of the King. When grace fills your heart, you will also be faithful in your covenant commitments. God talks about the, the sanctity of marriage. 
what God has brought together. Let not man put asunder. And it takes grace for two imperfect human beings to live together in unity and harmony. There are great joys that come in the married life, but there are also inevitable hurts that may occur also. But when we invite God to show us how to love our spouse the way he loves us, when we let his grace rule and reign in our lives and to flow through us, then we are strengthened by God to maintain our covenant commitments, to be faithful to the vows that we made before God. Number four, when grace fills your heart, you will keep your word. You'll let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. There, there's value in being a person of integrity, a person who keeps his or her commitments. If you tell somebody, I'll call you back within the next two or three hours, then call them back. If you say you're going to be at a certain place by such and such a time, then arrive on time. Now, sometimes things come up. Sometimes we forget. But if you forget and don't keep your commitment, then apologize and purpose in your heart not to not keep your word again. Ask God's forgiveness. Sometimes we run into traffic, so we're not able to arrive on time. But do your best to follow through on what it is that you say. Receive the grace of God. Walk under that grace. Walk under that favor. If you miss it, receive his grace. But also understand that his grace is a power and ability to do his will. And the last thing I want to share today is when grace fills your heart, you'll love everybody, even your enemies. That's grace. That's grace. Under the law, you plug my eye, eye out, I'll pluck your eye out. You cut my hand, I'll cut your hand. Under the law, there is a system of retribution. But when you walk in the grace of God, realizing how much God loves you, then there's a love that flows through your heart, even to your enemies. I know in my own life, I don't find it difficult to extend grace to others. You know why? Because I know me. I know how lost I was when Jesus found me. Jesus had grace on me. He forgave me of my sins, which were many. Jesus washed me and made me clean. Filled my heart with love and joy. So if God has done, my, my, my way of looking at it is this, if God's done that for me, who am I not to extend that same grace and that same love? To somebody else. When grace fills your heart, God gives you a song that never ends. When grace fills your heart, you see people as people rather than as objects. When grace fills your heart, you don't seek to attain righteousness through your own self-righteousness because that is pride. When you are filled with grace, you freely receive the righteousness that comes as a gift through Christ Jesus, and you give God praise. And when you walk in grace, you don't ignore the laws of God, but rather the grace of God that has been shed abroad in your heart. By the power of the Holy Spirit, God's grace enables you to do the will of God, to fulfill the law of Christ, to follow the instructions of God in his word. Because not one jot or one tittle 
will pass away until all be fulfilled. Thank God his word is being fulfilled in you by his grace. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for filling our hearts with your grace and with your goodness. You love us so deeply that it's like a river we can swim in and not drown. We are covered, surrounded, plunged into your abundant love. And having received that love and that righteousness, we freely pass it on to others. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but you want to give your heart to Christ today, I ask that you pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I confess my sins. I'm very sorry. Forgive me of my sins. I receive your grace. Forgive me, cleanse me, and make me whole. Jesus, you are my Lord, and I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer, God has bestowed grace upon you. Jesus has come into your heart and you are now a new person. Give God praise for his amazing grace. Before we receive our tithes and offerings, I do want to mention that uh, we are going to resume our regular Sunday morning services beginning on September, Sunday, September the 12th. We're gonna go back to having church every Sunday. Our service will begin at 10.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m., and we're going to have a glorious time. It's been quite a while since we've had communion together, and so we will receive Holy Communion on September the 12th. I'm teaching a message on the blood of Jesus Christ, and our own Cassandra Smith has prepared a praise dance about the blood. You don't want to miss this service. Invite family, invite friends. We are going to have a glorious, glorious time in Christ Jesus. And beginning Sunday, September the 12th, 10.30 a.m., we'll have service every Sunday morning at the Lord's Church of Asheville here at 36 Michigan Avenue. By that time also, the church will be renovated the inside of the church our sanctuary we will have a new carpet the walls will be completely painted uh, we're gonna have some new doors in the sanctuary the foyer is going to have a nice flooring the women's bathroom is going to be redone there's a lot of work that's been done uh, during the time that we've been out uh, out of church due to the pandemic and uh, that work is not just physical. There's a great spiritual work that God has been doing as well. I can't wait for us all to be back together again. We are asking everybody to wear masks. And of course, we are gonna just take the natural precautions of social distancing so we can remain safe. At this time, let us receive our tithes and our offerings. I thank God for your faithfulness in Given. I thank God for the way that he has blessed and prospered you and, and how he's meeting your needs and for your generosity in sowing into the kingdom of God. If you're writing out a check, you can write it out to the Lord's Church of Asheville or TLC Asheville for short. You may mail your tithes and offerings to P.O. Box 84, Arden, North Carolina, 28704. Let me say that again. The Lord's Church of Asheville, P.O. Box 84, Arden, North Carolina, 28704. You may also give on the church's website at www.tlcavl.com. www.tlcavl.com. Or feel free to give through the church's cash app dollar sign TLC ABL 321. All of this information 
uh, is available for you on the bottom of your screen. We thank God for your giving. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be the wind beneath your wings. And may you walk under the covering of his grace, fulfilling his word through a love relationship and obedience to Jesus Christ by the Holy Ghost. I hope you have a great week. And until next week, may all of heaven's blessings 